many of you, many of you might know that I enjoy cooking. Um, especially on the grill. That's why I enjoy the most. And uh, I cook the traditional Argentine asado. It's our version of the barbecue, the American barbecue without the sauce. Um, I can also cook a few things in a traditional kitchen. Thanks to the years I spent watching my wife doing some of the uh, recipes from her family, mother and grandmother. Also spent time with my mom when I was a little kid and watched her cook and bake. So I really enjoy cooking. And I know this is not the best time to talk about cooking in asados. Maybe it's not very wise of me. But I want to share a few secrets of a good Argentine asado. At least one secret. And one secret is the salt. I remember one time we got together with friends and family and we started cooking and um, the fire was almost ready, the meat was looking good and all of a sudden we asked, where's the salt? So one of the guys said, I got the salt, I got this special salt, I bought it and uh, we were kind of skeptical about it. We tried it, and we tried a little more. I don't know. We weren't too sure about that salt, but we used it anyways. We used it to cook the meat on the grill. Um, I don't remember ever in my life pouring so much salt to meet like that time. And after we finish cooking, we need to add more salt to the meat. So that salt, the salt was useless. It didn't have any taste, any value, any purpose. It didn't have any properties. It looked like salt. The container said salt, but it was wordless. So the secret is Morton coarse kosher salt. That is the secret. So this morning I'm not going to talk about cooking or asados. But I have a few thoughts about salt that I want to share with you. And in the Bible, we read many events when salt is mentioned. And we can see the different meanings and symbolisms that each episode contains. The role of salt in the Bible is... Uh, relevant to understanding Hebrew society during the Old Testament and during the New Testament. Salt was a necessity of life. And it was a mineral that was used since ancient times in many cultures as seasoning as preservative, disinfectant. It was a component of ceremonial offerings. And also was used as a unit of exchange. Because salt was very valuable. The Bible contains numerous references 
to salt in various contexts, it is used as a metaphor to signify permanence, loyalty, durability, fidelity, usefulness, value, and purification. One of the metaphors of salt in the Bible was purification. I found other interesting facts about salt. In old times, the eating of salt was a sign of friendship. It was a covenant of friendship. Also, I find out that newborn babies were rubbed with salt. A reference of, to these practices in Ezekiel 16.4 says, On the day you were born, your navel cord was not cut, nor were you washed in water to cleanse you. You were not rubbed with salt or wrapped in swaddling clothes. And I found a little more about this practice. It says, immediately after birth, the baby is salted to prevent bad smell, to prevent sweating and rashes, to ensure a nice, smooth, puffy body. Salting an infant's skin during the early neonatal period is an old custom in Turkish communities that probably originated in Middle Asia. Salting a baby is a practice performed in order to increase the possibilities that the baby will be a healthy one. I thought that was interesting. Never heard of that before. Now, we also know that salt is required in sacrifices. We can see in Leviticus chapter 2, verse 13. It says, In every offering of your grain offering, you shall season with salt. You shall not allow the salt of the covenant of your God to be lacking from your grain offering. With all your offerings, you shall offer salt. Like I said, there was many references to salt in the Bible and the applications and the meanings. And the story I want to read this morning that involves salt is the story of the prophet Elisha. When he was asked to do something about the waters of Jericho. Second Kings chapter 2. And I promise I will get to my point, to my point really quick. Second Kings verse um, chapter two. Probably we'll start on verse thirteen. But this happens right after Elijah is taken into heaven. Elijah was taken into heaven with a chariot of fire, and Elisha was there to take the mantle of the prophet. And I'll say, there were two miracles performed by Elisha, back to back, as soon as he grabbed the prophet's mantle. Two miracles back to back, and both miracles involve water. Second Kings 2.13 He also took up the mantle of Elijah 
that I had fallen from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the mantle of Elijah that has fallen from him, from him and struck the water and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also struck the water, it was divided this way and that. And Elisha crossed over. That is the first miracle the prophet Elijah did right after he grabbed the mantle of the prophet. Now, we can skip to verse 19. Second Kings 2, 19 says, Elisha performs miracles. Verse 19 says, Then the men of the city said to Elisha, Please notice, the situation of the city is pleasant, as my Lord sees, but the water is bad, and the ground barren. And he said, Bring me a new bowl and put salt in it. So they brought it to him. Verse 21. Then he went out to the source of the water and cast in the salt there and said, Thus said the Lord, I have healed this water. From it there shall be no more death or barrenness. So the water remained healed to this day, according to the word of Elijah, which he spoke. Hallelujah. This is powerful. This is a remarkable miracle. This is an awesome story. And as always, we can find some teachings and lessons for our lives here. So we see that the city water source was polluted and harmful, bringing sickness, death, and infertility. In this context, Elisha performs a miracle. God tells him to throw salt in the water And God, in his mercy, then uses the soul to heal the water so it becomes wholesome and life-given. There is a big problem in this city, the city of Jericho. Verse 19 says that the city was in a great location, pleasant. The city looked good. Everything looked okay. It's all good in here. No problems whatsoever. This brings me to the first point I want to make this morning. Sometimes in our lives and in the lives of others, We believe that everything is okay, that everything looks fine. All seems to be under control. We are in a good position. The appearances, the appearances were good, but the water was bad. It was a great city, but a great city without a source of water, without a source of life. So I look up the meaning of bad water here in the scripture, what it means. And this water was harmful, unpleasant sad, 
unhappy. The meaning of bad water was evil, bitter, wicked, given pain, and given misery. The city was being fed, if you can say it, with bad water. It was harmful. It was bitter. And we know that water is a symbol of life. Water is a symbol of cleanliness, of creation, refreshment. But we see here that this water represents all the opposite. There are two other things that are important things that I want to point out about this story, not just the water. But I want to point out the bowl and the salt. The bowl he asked for was a new bowl. He asked for a new tool. The prophet Elijah asked for a fresh thing. He didn't ask for an old bowl or something that was used before. This bowl was never used for preparing food or for carrying things or for washing things. This was a new bowl. This bowl was never used for anything else before. As if this bowl needed to be fresh. This bowl needed to be new, holy, and pure. Seems like he asked for a fresh new bowl because he needed to be perfect. So the same way we approach God with our needs, these men approach the prophet in this story. And they say, look, here's my problem. Here's an issue. Even though everything looks good in the surface, there's a deeper problem that needs your attention. And the Lord is saying, first of all, don't try to fix it using the same old ways that you already know. I need, you to, sh I need to show you a new thing. Or at least this is what the Lord is telling me. The symbol of this bowl, this new bowl. I need to show you a new thing. Your concepts are old. Your experiences are in the past. I am the same, but I'm doing new things. And I'm not talking about singing old songs or new songs. As the prophet said, bring me a new bowl, the same way the Lord is saying, I need to do this in a new way. Don't expect me to do things like you think I should do it. Because I'm doing all things new. This is what the Lord and the Spirit of the Lord is telling me about this bowl. This is a new thing. I believe in this present time that we're living in, this bowl is a new move of God. It's a fresh new awakening. It's a new vessel. It's a new vehicle. It's a new tool 
where everything is made new. And as for this miracle to happen, it's necessary the salt. And the salt is the salt is his life in us. The salt represents healing, restoration, anointing. So we can bring a miracle to a land that is sick and desperate and to a, a land that does not have healthy water to drink. And when I say a land, I'm not talking about a physical place. A land that needs healing can be your heart, can be a family member, a brother, a sister, a child. And I believe that it's this is not only for the younger generation. I believe it's for all of us. If God is going to do something new, it's going to use all of us. We are all salt. I've already seen how God is doing something new and fresh with the youth. I praise the Lord for it. And like I said before, I've seen God doing things suddenly. We are the salt. Do you believe this? Amen. Are we pure salt or are we contaminated? We are salt because Jesus is the salt in our lives. We can become salt by our own actions. Some people wants to, want, they want to justify themselves and say, well, I'm a good person. I help others. I give to charity. I serve the Lord. But it's not by works. It's not by actions. Why are we salt? We are salt because Jesus is doing the works in our lives. So we can reflect him to others. If we become more like him, we can be more salt to ourselves and to others. But if we are losing our properties to be sold, to conserve, to preserve, to heal, perhaps it's because we are not in close contact or in touch with the source of the salt. The salt mine that is Jesus Christ, our Savior. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, says, Believers are salt and light. And Jesus said in verse 13, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing, but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lamps on a lamp stamp, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see the good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Hallelujah. We are the salt. We are the light. Glory to God. 
I've mentioned, I've mentioned the water before, and I have a few questions about the water that you don't have to answer. I think it's called rhetorical questions, just to make you think. What is the source of your water? Why is it contaminated? Is it because the waters are stagnant? Are those waters motionless? Are those waters running waters? Or are they still? The Gospel of John, chapter 7, verse 37, says, On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the Scriptures said, out of his heart, will flow rivers of living waters. Hallelujah. He said, believe in me, and the Holy Spirit will flow from your heart. Those living waters, healing waters, fresh waters. Is your salt pure and clean? Can your water and the water of others be healed with that salt? The Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verse 49 says, For everyone will be seasoned with fire, and every sacrifice will be seasoned with salt. Salt is good. But if the salt loses its flavor, how will you season it? Have salt in your lives and have peace with one another. So perhaps this land, this land that needs healing is your own life. Perhaps it's the life of somebody you know. Perhaps it's a relationship with somebody, with your children, with your spouse, with family members. Or maybe this land that needs healing is your relationship with God. So, are you going to be the salt in your family? Are you going to be the salt in your marriage? Are you going to be the salt in your school? In your job? Are you going to be the salt in the chats on social media? Are you going to be salt here in your church? In your city? In your nation? Again, on Second Kings chapter 2, verse 21 and 22, says, The Lord said, I have healed the waters. There shall be no more death or infertility. So the waters remain healed until this day. Amen. A new bowl, a fresh new thing with salt, salt that can heal and restore, and waters 
that brings life and abundance. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this day, for your word. Lord, I thank you because you always speak to my heart very simple. Thank you for your teachings. Lord, let me be salt in my life. Let me be salt in life of others. Lord, I'm ready for the new bowl that you bring into this earth. I'm ready for the new thing you want to do. Lord, and Lord, don't let my waters to get contaminated. Remind me, Lord. Remind me that I can heal the waters. With the salt I can get from that source that is you. I praise you, Lord. I give you thanks. Amen.